<laughs> they shouldn't believe me. Um, so thank you all for coming. I'm David Lamb. I'm the director of the Institute for Social Research. It's great to have you here. Uh, and I get to introduce our uh, exciting speaker of the day. Uh, this event is uh, kicking off uh, year two of ISR's uh, implementation of our uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion strategic plan, uh, year two of uh, five years. And I want to thank uh, everybody who's been involved in the uh, initiative so far, uh, especially Sarah Burgard, who's, uh, who's been guiding the process. Um, our first year was off to a good start. We did a lot of interesting things last year. Nothing super big and flashy, but I think that's inevitable in the kind of long-term process we're trying to do. Uh, and it'll relate uh, to some of Scott's uh, uh, points. Um, but we did do some very interesting things that I think helped lay the foundation for the even more ambitious goals we have. We did unconscious bias training for 85 supervisors and a bunch of other people as well. Um, we did little things that I think are sort of mundane but extremely important to, uh, to meeting our goals, like improving <coughs> the way we uh, post positions, recruit for positions, uh, the whole recruitment process, improvements in accessibility for our events and our announcements and, uh, and uh, things like that. Uh, <clears throat> we have plans to improve our orientation of new staff and uh, faculty, to develop more interaction across the centers. Uh, and the programs, and we've already had a lot of uh, successful activities uh, in those. And I think those really helped lay the foundation for some very ambitious plans we have for year two, including some big hiring uh, initiatives and other uh, activities. And it's great to have this uh, uh, event to begin today. Um, we have some more events happening this fall. We have a town hall meeting on uh, October 24th uh, from 10 to 11.30. I want to call your attention to uh, a very exciting symposium that we've organized in conjunction with all of these other uh, schools and colleges. Uh, it's focusing on University of Michigan alumni, mostly PhD alumni of considerable distinction out in the many, uh, mainly social science fields at uh, universities and other institutions, but also people in government and NGOs, uh, talking about many dimensions of uh, racial, gender, socioeconomic uh, inequality. So it's been a big planning process. It's uh, quite an exciting uh, event. It'll be in Rackham, and announcements like that uh, about it will be uh, coming out. You can read about it on the ISR website and the websites of all these other uh, units. Uh, but now let me turn to, uh, to the event uh, for today, which is uh, uh, Scott Page. Scott is, um, I think, widely considered to be one of the coolest guys on campus. Uh, he has an extremely interesting background and um, you know, does this amazing thing of taking very sophisticated mathematical modeling and applying it to things like uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, some of the most kind of topical uh, real world uh, issues of the day. So uh, not everybody can pull that off. Scott's made a career of it and, and does uh, fascinating uh, work. His uh, background sort of speaks to his uh, 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 what he does and the, and the interesting way he mixes things together. He has a, a BA and an MA in uh, mathematics. Uh, he has an MA and PhD in managerial economics from Northwestern. Uh, worked with some really interesting economists. As, uh, combines economics and mathematics and complex systems. He's been director of our uh, Center for uh, complex systems here at uh, Michigan. He's the uh, Leo Hertwitz Collegiate Professor of Political Science, Complex Systems and Economics, and he's also importantly a research professor uh, here in ISR's Center for Political Studies. And he's also an external faculty member uh, of the uh, Santa Fe Institute where a lot of this uh, cool uh, complex systems work uh, gets done. Um, he's a Guggenheim Fellow, a Fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, a University of Michigan uh, Society of Fellows uh, senior uh, fellow. Uh, Scott has written a number of uh, really interesting books that have gotten a lot of attention. I'll just mention uh, some of them before building up to his new book. Uh, this book, Complex Adaptive Systems, um, uh, written with uh, John Miller. John Miller was actually one of my students. I'm happy to take parts of credit for this. So I was on John's dissertation committee ages ago. He was uh, actually a trainee in the Population Studies Center uh, and uh, got his PhD in economics. Um, this really does a great work of sort of 
basic introduction to to complex systems has gotten a lot of attention. very nice quote here from kenneth arrow, nobel prize winner in economics this is a book that that really scott became very well known for called the difference, very very relevant to the kinds of issues he'll be talking about today. very nice things about it in the new york times um worth reading this new york times review. rather than ponder moral questions like why can't we all get along dr. page asked practical ones like how can we all be more productive together the answer he suggests is in messy creative organizations and environments with individuals from vastly different backgrounds and life experiences. so i'd like to say that i'm doing everything i can as isr director to make us a messy creative organization and have quite a lot to show for so far. Um, diversity and complexity came out in 2010 uh, another nice note from uh, from uh, ken arrow uh, another building on this uh, really bringing together this interest in mathematical modeling of complex systems with this interest in uh, diversity a really uh, important book and then his new book um, just off the presses i think it like just came out last week right uh, i got a copy of nicholas uh, the diversity bonus um, a quote, an excellent book that combines convincing stories and persuasive arguments about the benefits of diversity. It really is, I won't claim to have read it since I got this last evening, but I did read quite a lot of it and, and browse through it. It really is full of like amazing uh, stories, uh, uh, many of which I'm sure we'll hear about uh, from Scott um, today. Uh, one of the places where Scott takes off in the introduction to his book is to allude to the uh, famous quotes, famous at Michigan, famous in other places that uh, Justice Scalia made in the uh, uh, oral arguments in the uh, Grutter versus Bollinger case, the University of Michigan Law School uh, Supreme Court case, uh, in which uh, Scalia suggested that Michigan had created its own problem by deciding to be a super duper law school, um, uh, to, to use Scalia's words. Uh, and it traded off uh, diversity against being uh, uh, against being super duper. It sort of introduced this notion that uh, that there's a trade-off. You can you can be diverse uh, or you can be great. Um, Scott's big point is there isn't there need not be such a trade-off, and you'll hear him talk about that. He starts his uh, book with this quote from uh, Wendell Berry: uh, "We've been wrong. We must change our lives so that it will be possible to live by the contrary assumption." that what is good for the world will be good uh, for us. So this idea of a contrary assumption, which is what he calls uh, his uh, introduction, uh, that in fact um, we can uh, have a diverse uh, work environment uh, and actually benefit it from it and get this uh, diversity bonus. So the idea of the diversity bonus is this uh, contrary assumption. And I'll let uh, Scott uh, explain it to you. Um, so it's very exciting to have Scott here. Uh, we know that the diversity, equity, inclusion initiative that we're doing in ISR and all across the Michigan campus coincides with our uh, core values, our core uh, mission. Uh, it fits with the kind of work we do here in ISR uh, uh, almost perfectly, uh, and fits very well with the with the goals and values that we have for ISR as an institution and uh, the university as an institution. I think Scott's book doesn't suggest that this is going to be uh, easy. We know it's hard work. We're trying to, uh, to take on a lot of things at once to try to really achieve these uh, goals. Um, but really, Scott's perspective really you know, makes me even more excited than I already was about uh, trying to achieve these diversity goals, because he really uh, goes with this idea that not only is this the right thing to do, uh, but it's actually going to make ISR a better place, a more interesting place, a more productive place, uh, an even more exciting place to uh, work and do research. So it's a great pleasure to have you here, Scott. <clears throat> I'll turn it over to you. You want to just keep going? Uh -oh. Okay. Let's We're in see. better hands here. Let's there you go. See. That's fine. Show doesn't have too many options in there. There it is. 
There we go. We're good. All right. Um, thank you, David. It's a pleasure to be here. Today was a big day for ISR because uh, Skip Lupia, my colleague, and then James Jackson, who's been a mentor of mine, both won uh, the University Outreach Awards today, which is fantastic to hear because I think that oftentimes we think of outreach from universities being in the natural sciences, not in the social sciences. So it was, it was wonderful that the first awards, two of the three, the other one to Megan Duffy, went to ISR. So that's uh, a great thing. I think we should give Skip and James a round of applause. <laughs> David mentioned, what I want to do today is talk about, a little bit about uh, this new book I have called The Diversity Bonus. And um, this is a book that is really a Michigan book. Earl Lewis, who's the head of the Mellon Foundation, um, was the dean of the graduate school when I was here. And he and Nancy Cantor put together a group of people um, to create a series called Our Compelling Interest, to write a series of about maybe 10 to 15 books over the next decade on issues related to race in America. And this is the first monograph in that series, although it's not technically a monograph. One of the issues is you can't really write a book saying that diverse groups do better by yourself, right? That sort of would defeat the purpose. So uh, this is a book, I mean, I'm gonna quote Daryl Strawberry, who played for the Mets one time. Somebody asked him, what do you think of your autobiography? He said, I don't know, I haven't read it yet. Um, the same was sort of true of this book. People would say, what do you think of your new book? And I said, well, I don't know, I haven't read it yet. And the reason why is this is Catherine Phillips, who in the book, um, the main part of the book was written by me, and then Catherine wrote a critique of the book. But so that I wouldn't sneak in corrections to her critique, I wasn't allowed to read Catherine's critique of the book. So I literally didn't read the book until the book showed up on my doorstep. And so um, you can see we're still friends. This was taken yesterday or last week in LA. Um, it's a solid critique, but it's worth reading because um, Catherine comes at this. She's an organizational studies professor at uh, Columbia and a dean in the business school there. And um, she comes at it from a very different perspective. So I'm gonna talk about my part of the book, but her part of the book is, I think, equally interesting. So here's where I wanna sort of start from. I wanna start from a, a quote by Astro Teller. I was out at a, a New York Times event on sort of where does innovation come from? And it sort of turned into a diversity event because that Astro was sort of the lead speaker. And what, one of the things that he really pushes is that Google, when they really try to, you know, he runs Google X, when they really try to do exciting things, what they're looking for is not so much just smart people, they're looking for people who think differently. And so one of the things when we think about where innovation comes from, where progress comes from, it comes from people who don't necessarily think like you or look like you. So what I wanna do today in this talk is really do a couple things. I wanna sort of lay out kind of the core logic for why diversity works, which is gonna be contrary to Scalia. And in doing that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to present sort of a conditional story. I'll talk about when diversity is really a good thing and when maybe diversity isn't a good thing. So Scalia will be right in some cases, just not in the important cases. And um, I'll sort of unpack this in terms of specific tasks. Now, when I talk about diversity, I'm going to talk about cognitive diversity first, which are going to be differences in how we frame things, different information, different knowledge, different heuristics, different algorithms, different sort of perspectives on problems. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about identity diversity, which is gonna be one of the causes of cognitive diversity, okay? And the, the core message is gonna be that cognitive diversity improves performance on complex tasks, and identity diversity correlates with, in some cases, causes cognitive diversity, which therefore leads to better outcomes on complex tasks. So that's sort of the story. Um, here's the Scalia quote, right? Scalia's like, look, excellence, diversity. So he used, he used the legal term, super duper. Right, which, uh, but it's you know, super duper or diverse. And the point is that that's not true, okay? It's one of the things I, I teach an undergraduate modeling class and I begin the class by talking what I call the opposite proverb problem, which is that anything your grandfather said, he who hesitates is lost. Your grandmother said the opposite, a stitch in time saves not. Two heads are better than one, too many cooks spill the broth. So every proverb has an opposite, and the reason why is most knowledge is conditional. There's cases where a stitch in time saves nine, and there's cases when he who hesitates is lost. So the, as mentioned, I begin the book with this quote by Wendell Berry, and uh, I had an opportunity to hang out with Wendell um, a few years back, and I had to write him to say, you know, can I use this quote? And it was great, because Wendell actually, um, when I came here to Michigan, I lived on Rur Rural Route 3, in Yankee Springs, Michigan. When I got here, we got a house number, which was 2532. But Wendell still lives in rural Route 1 in Port Jefferson, Kentucky, which was kind of a thrill. So I said something there, and he said something back. I said, can I use this quote? And Wendell was pretty terse. So back, sure, great. But I, I kept it anyway. Okay. So 
what I want to do is I want to sort of go through the logic of the contrary assumption. And again, as David mentioned, I'm a theorist, which is a strange thing to be an ISR, which is kind of a big data place. But the idea here and what drives the book is that theory is incredibly important in terms of driving practice. Right? So if you don't have a theoretical understanding of what you're doing, it's like driving a ship without a rudder and compass. So I was at a talk this morning by Trisha Jackson, who does mathematical models of cancer from our math department. And she's basically saying they're writing these differential, equa differential equation models of cancer. You can figure out like sort of how much of different you know, drugs you should put in the system. Right? So modeling is really sort of a useful way to understand sort of where the lever points are. Okay? So let's get to this idea. So we do things like predict, solve, design, act, evaluate, verify, engineer. This is kind of what the modern economy is all about. And in these spaces, what I'm going to argue is the diversity is really, really useful. Now, obviously, in 45 minutes, I can't go through all of them. I'm going to talk just quickly about predicting and solving. Okay, I'm not going to talk about everything. So here's sort of how I view things. I think a long time ago, like 50, 60 years ago, most things were probably in this no bonus camp. There wasn't a lot of diversity bonuses. And there was a small segment of things that were sort of more cognitive that were the diversity bonuses. Now I think we're in a space where most things are sort of in diversity bonus land, where differences matter just as much as ability. Although in trying to figure these things out, this is a, my co-author, Lou Hong, and I often joke that this is kind of like where we're at. There's some things we know where there's no bonuses. There's some things where there's bonuses. And there's a bunch of stuff we're still trying to figure out. right? Um, and you'll see a sense of that as I sort of go through the talk. So let's talk, start in no bonus land. So this is a Northern Michigan logging camp. And when they would hire people at Northern Michigan logging camps, they would kind of line you up and they'd say, how many trees can you chop down? So this big dude could chop down 12. This smaller guy who's smoking a pipe, right, can only chop down eight. And what they do is if you, could, if you could chop down enough trees, they would hire you with one condition. They would also count the number of teeth you had. Because if you didn't have enough teeth, then you couldn't eat meat fast enough to get enough protein to continue to chop down trees at that rate. So it's kind of like a trees plus teeth score that you would get. And the higher the score, the more likely you'd get higher. Right? So in that world, if I have these five people and I want to know sort of like how many trees can they chop down together, you just sum it up. It's additive. <coughs> this is Scalia's world. Okay? So let's be really clear. This is a set of assumptions where Scalia is absolutely right. If you want to have diversity, like small people who smoke pipes, it's going to cost you, right? Because he's not going to be good at chopping down trees. But the thing is that the, what someone contributes to the group, you can completely separate out as their own personal ability, right? So it adds up, it sums. Let's look at what happens in the modern economy. So this is a, an Amazon warehouse. I put this in because everybody's competing for Amazon, these Amazon warehouses. They ship out, the company does, about 306 boxes a second during slow times. During peak times, 500 boxes a second. This is Andrea Steves, who's one of my students. And when she went to Amazon, she got put on a committee to figure out how many boxes and what size boxes should Amazon have. Right? This is a really tricky thing. She can't just have one big box, because then you'd waste a ton of cardboard. Right? You also can't have 38 sizes of boxes, because then people sitting in those warehouses and the robots are thinking, which box should I have? Right? So you can't have too many, you can't have too few. What are the right sizes, all that sort of stuff. Why does this matter? The reason this matters is their shipping cost, this year will be 16 billion, last year they're 11.5 billion. So if they can save 3%, this committee, that's 50% more money than we get from the state of Michigan as a university. Right? So these are huge scales. So that's why when you think about, if you can just find a slightly better solution to a problem, you get this huge, huge bonus. Okay. So what do we mean by a complex task, having complex systems? You mean something where there's sort of lots of interactions between things, and there's no sort of simple additive thing. So this is, I was involved in this project with Joe Jackerloff looking at obesity. It was funded by the Foresight Group out of England. And this is it. We solved it. You know, really not hard. Right there it is. And if you look at this map in sort of a little bit greater relief, you see there's all these different categories here, like media, social, psychological, economic, food, activity, infrastructure. So everything from big cokes to genetics is on this graph. And so the idea that someone could be an expert in obesity right, makes sense. You could be an expert in obesity. But the idea that like, if you're putting together a team of people to understand obesity, that you could somehow line them up and have them chop down trees, and you'd pick the best people, that doesn't make any sense. right? So what you need is you need some levels of competence in terms of understanding parts of things, but you really care about is some sort of diversity in terms of coverage on the problem. Right? So the best team here is going to consist of people who've got diverse background knowledge. OK, so let me walk through some of the logic and evidence. So the first thing, why is this book called 
the diversity bonus. We went back, one of the things, you know, we went back and forth on sort of how do we sort of frame the central argument. The reason why is this, is that um, in going on and presenting this work to a lot of places, and also when um, Earl and Nancy asked me to write a new book, one of the questions, one of the things was when I went and talked to people, people say, oh, I understand diversity, it's like a portfolio of assets. Right? That's what you hear all the time. That's what I heard from the Federal Reserve, from BlackRock, all these places. And the idea is, like, if I invest in a portfolio of assets, maybe the yellow is the airline industry, which is doing really well, or maybe the blue dot line is the oil industry, which is not doing well. So when oil prices are cheap, airline prices do well, you know, you sort of mitigate risk by having a balanced portfolio. But the thing is, with your portfolio, you get the average, right? What I'm gonna show is that that's not true when you think about diverse groups of people. You don't get the average, you actually literally get a bonus. And that's not gonna be a sort of a metaphorical thing, it's actually gonna be like a mathematical thing. We'll actually get mathematically a bonus, okay? So I'm gonna start with a book by a friend of mine, Jim Sirwicky, called The Wisdom of Crowds. It came out a long time ago. And Jim begins this book with the 1906 West of England Fat Stock and Poultry Exhibition. There's 787 people who guess the weight of a steer. So these are like all their guesses. Their average guess is 1,197 pounds. The steer weighs 1,198 pounds. So this is a great anecdote to begin your book with if you want to sell a lot of copies to your book. But in some ways you look at this and you think, okay, why was that the case? What is it that allowed this particular book, this group to be smart? And this is what Jim uh, spends the book unpacking. <coughs> well, here's what you can do, and here's where sort of the mathematical modeling comes in really useful and provides sort of a rudder and compass. You can prove the following simple algebraic equation, that the crowd's error equals the average error of the people in the crowd minus the diversity of their predictions, so how different their predictions are. Now, I mean this in a um, very serious, boring sort of mathematical sense. Let me sort of unpack this in sort of a simple way. So this theta is the truth. So mathematicians use Greek letters to make things even harder than they normally be, right? So this is the truth, and that's the crowd's prediction, which is just the average of the prediction. So that first term is just how far is the crowd from the truth? So if the truth was 1,000 pounds and the crowd said 1,100 pounds, the crowd's error would be 100, and then you square it so that all errors are positive, right? The second term is just the average of the individual people's errors. So this SI is just what person I predicts. This is just how far off is person I. We sum them up and we average them. So if you have a portfolio of stocks, you'd get that the performance equals the average performance of people in it. But if we're predicting, it turns out, you don't get that the crowd's performance equals the average performance of the people in it. You get that the crowd's performance equals the average performance of the people in it. In some sense, plus, even this is a minus because these are errors, how diverse the predictions are. Now, why is that? This seems pretty weird. Well, here's why. It's very straightforward. Suppose David and I are both predicting something that has a value of 10. Suppose we're both off by 2. If we're both off by 2, then the crowd is off by 2 if we're off in the same direction. But if he's too low and I'm too high, our errors cancel out. So if you think of this like a statistician, you're saying, oh, those are errors canceling out. If you think of this like someone who thinks about people bringing diverse understandings to a problem, what that is is our different ways of looking at the world leading to a collective understanding that's correct, right? Because his particular way of looking at the world looked at some dimensions, mine looked at different dimensions. If we're looking at different things, we're likely to make different types of errors, and those different errors will cancel out. So when you think about prediction, there actually is a bonus, okay? So if you go back to Dalton's data, this is what it looks like. The crowd was off by a pound. It's actually 1.4 pounds, so when you square it, you get two. The average error was about 75 pounds. So the point is, I use this exact line all the time, these were not cattle weight guessing savants from the west of England. It wasn't like they could just look at a steer and all know the weight exactly, right? They were no different than we would be. Now the thing is, you think, okay, so what's going on here? Why are they so diverse, right? It was just, just random luck, and I used to sort of say, to quote my yoga teacher in LA and say, label it a thought, put it away, right? Just let it go. But then I was presenting this in our psychology department and someone said, oh, that's obvious why they're diverse. And I'm like, please tell me why. And they said, well, this is probably just anchoring an adjustment bias. They just bought their own cattle to market, right? They knew the weight of their own steers and they probably adjusted. That looks a little bit bigger than mine, that weighed 1,000 pounds. It's a little bit less than mine, which weighed 1,300 pounds. And so literally their, their own sort of diverse knowledge base has probably led them to be diverse. So here's Sirwicky's book in a nutshell, which is amazing. Sirwicky says, what makes for a wise crowd? So he's restricting himself to cases where the crowd error is small, otherwise it's not a wise crowd. He's only including it in the book if it's kind of amazing, which means that the average error has to be big. 
So therefore, if you only look at cases where the crowd is wise and the problem is hard, what do you have to find? The crowd has to be diverse. What is the grand conclusion of his book? Wise crowds come from diverse people. But what's interesting is his book is basically saying they come from diverse people in terms of backgrounds, information, knowledge, identity, those sorts of things. Whereas this is just saying statistically, it comes from people having different models. So it's Sirikki, who's got a PhD in American studies, is basically showing is that if you do ethnographic research, you find that sort of ethnographic types of diversity correlate with wise crowds. This is saying sort of giving it a mathematical justification for why it's true. Now this is kind of, you know, what Jim is doing is looking for amazing cases, right? So he's engaged in an exercise in selection bias. Like, let's only look at cases where there's wise crowds. The interesting thing, and when I wrote the, the first book, The Difference, it's primarily a theoretical book, so I wasn't really that interested or really engaged in how big are these bonuses. And so one of the reasons for writing this book was in the intervening 10 years, there's been just a huge sort of um, effort to gather more and more data. Right? There's been all sorts of prediction contests. It's easier to scrape the web for data. And one of the things that we found that's been amazing is the size of these bonuses exceed anything I would have dared made up. Right? So if somebody would have said to me, Scott, make up data for your new book, I would not have made up this data. It would have seemed like I was cheating. Okay? So portfolio, you get the average. Group of predictors, you get better than the average. Right? Let me do one example in some depth, and then let me show you I'll show you some more specific data. So this is the Netflix prize. How many know about the Netflix prize? Just so I, a couple of people. So 2006, Reed Hastings and Neil Hunt from Netflix said, we have this internal thing called Cinemax, which says how much you like a movie. What we're going to do is we're going to put all of our data on the web. And if you can beat us by 10%, if you can beat us by 10%, I'll give you a million bucks. Okay? So here's what I mean by beat you by 10%. If I type in Avatar, because I have two teenage sons, it'll predict that I'm going to give it five stars. Okay, David, who's an intellectual, works at ISR, is going to predict two stars, right, based on our demographics. If either of us, or if any sentient being, types in Rush Hour 3, it's going to say one star. <laughs> it's not a good movie, okay? So some movies, like Rush Hour 3, very easy to predict. Other movies, like Avatar, hard to predict. So they just had an error function, right? How many stars are you off by? And if you could be off by 10% fewer stars, right, just like that diversity prediction theorem, we give you a million bucks. Six years of data, half million users, 18,000 movies. This is the kind of thing people that ISR would love. The interesting thing here is this is now illegal. The same Scalia we saw earlier in the presentation basically said, no, 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 no. This is way too much information to let loose in enemy hands, AE academics, whatever. So this is the largest data set ever publicly released. It may always be the largest data set, right, other than Equifax. Okay? <laughs> so, the question is then, what happens? And why does this matter in terms of diversity? Well, here's where diversity comes in, which is super interesting. So you have all these teams of data scientists, this is straight out of like, you know, ISR, sitting down thinking about how do people decide which movies they like? So what we've got to do is we've got to sort of come up with a way to categorize or place attributes on movies. So we're gonna put attributes on movies and then we'll give people weights on these attributes. So every single model that people constructed had this flavor to it, right? You sort of define the movie as a vector and you define people as vectors, and you kind of ask, like, you know, do people like this movie? So, for example, some of these attributes might be how much money to make in the box office, how many weeks in the theaters, an action drama comedy, how many days has it been available, what are the critical reviews, what are the ratings? The challenge here, though, is you, only, you can only do things that you could scrape off the web, because there's 18,000 movies, right? So you couldn't have things that, like, you hand-coded, like you'd watch the movie and say, I'll give it a score of five here because you have to watch 18,000 movies. So it had to be things you could scrape. Some of the things that were interesting that mattered is like, is Will Smith in the movie, or is Morgan Freeman in the movie? They were the only two people that were only in good movies. Even Meryl Streep is in some dog movies, it turns out. But um, So they, they were just searching for anything that might load. So who's winning in this? This is what's kind of interesting. So the early leader in this is Belcourt. This is AT&T Research Park, but the team name is called Belcourt. And this is Dr. Robert Bell, who's fantastic. They had him in for a talk in complex systems. They had 50 dimensions that they looked at for each movie, which is incredible. I mean, sit down at home tonight, try to think of 50 dimensions for a movie, and then restrict yourself to things that you could pull from the web, right, and download. It's absolutely remarkable. They have 107 different models that they constructed, because these are you know, this question of how do you weight them, all that sort of stuff. Their best model can be by 6.8%. When they average the models, they get to 8.4%, right? 
Now again, this should be counterintuitive because the best one's 6.8%. They're averaging it in with ones that get 6.6, 6.5, 6.4, 6.3, 6 but because there's a diversity bonus, they can get to 8.4%. So the bummer about this contest is you get about 18 months in and they're still at like 9%. Nobody can win. Nobody can get to 10%. So Dr. Bell's boss calls him in and says, um, okay, we now know that you're the best in the world at this thing, which is great, but you have this thing that we call a job, and we'd like you to go back to your job, right? And so Dr. Bell basically cues the Rocky music and says, fine, I'll just win this thing then. And his boss is like, I'm kind of confused here. How are you going to win this thing? And he's like, easy. I'll just call someone not as good as me. His boss is like, who would that be? He's like, well, anybody, right? I mean, he's the best. We've got 18 months of data saying he's the best. So he calls in this other team called Big Chaos, which is in second place, who are Austrians who weren't as good at figuring out like, what the categories were, but they were really good at figuring out what weights to put on the movies, like to put on the different models. So they're really good at weighting different models, which is a real art. And they get close, but they don't get to 10%. They skip over a bunch of teams and go down and pick up these Canadians called Pragmatic Theory, who seem to be doing some weird stuff that nobody else had figured out. What the Canadians figured out, and I'll just mention this one, which was delay, which is sometimes called the Will Ferrell effect or the snakes on a plane effect. Here's what they figured out. That Will Ferrell is like a margarita. If you watch a Will Ferrell movie, right after you watch it, it seems really good. And if you watch two Will Ferrell movies, they seem great. The next morning, not so great. So the longer you wait, to review a Will Ferrell movie, the worse it does. So if you do insurance modeling here, there's things called hazard rates, where you just kind of like fall off. It's like a Will Ferrell snakes on a plane hazard. Like right after you saw snakes on a plane, you're like, a classic. Three weeks later, you're like, I can't even believe I watched that thing, right? Those are the sort of subtle insights that escaped the best minds at Bell Labs, not surprisingly, in my day. But we're obvious to Canadians, to all Canadians. Okay, so, now when they get together, this is kind of amazing because we're almost two years in, 800 variables. This should just blow your mind that they can figure out 800 different ways to parse these movies. Their best model is still only getting at 8.4%. But this is by, by searching among these things, they can get to 8.4%. When they combine their models, they get to 10%. So they win, except for they don't win because the contest rules say once somebody gets to 10%, the contest doesn't end for, then, then ends in 30 days. The reason for this was they were concerned about undergraduates at Illinois who have access to this complete cluster, downloading the data, hitting return, and just buying everybody pizza for life, creating some sort of pizza annuity at the University of Illinois or something, right? It turned out someone from Illinois did download the data and beat it by 5% within the first couple of days. So it wasn't an unreasonable assumption. When Dr. Bell finds this out, he's like, we're now working around the clock the next 30 days. The reason why is this. He knows there's 23 teams from 30 countries that he's been beating for two years. And he knows two things about those teams. He knows he's smarter than them. He's more excellent. He's more super duper than they are, as Scalia would say. But they're more diverse, right? And so he knows this is going to be like excellence against diversity, and diversity wins. With two days to go, the also rans from the other countries just they sent all their data Berkeley and Penn to these grad students who tried to figure out combinations of models that would work, and they beat Belcourt. So they, Belcour submits their final thing. It ends up sort of a dead tie. Belcour submit, this is the first time in history graduate students have ever been punished for checking their work. The ensemble checked their work one last time and submitted 22 minutes later and therefore didn't win. So Belcour won. But because the, because the ensemble was graduate students, which is a synonym for snarky, on their web page, when this thing was all over, they said, here's the final results. It's official. Belcour takes second. And the beauty of this is they're absolutely 100% right. I've got two models that are wildly diverse, that are equally accurate. I have a theorem that says crowd error equals average error minus diversity. So therefore, what has to be better is a 50-50 average. Not could be, might be, has to be. Kind of like leg squared, leg squared equals hypotenuse squared has to be, right? This just has to be true. So what you get here, this is like sort of the fifth time. When you, when you do these prediction things, there's just bonuses, bonuses, bonuses. Now you could say, ah, you know, what's 1%, 2%, they went to 6.8% to 10%. You know, this is coming up, I'm teaching this modeling class on growth, right? The difference between 3% growth and 6% growth, 
economically is the difference between your economy doubling every twenty four years or doubling every twelve years. right? so these small margins, it's just like the amazon three percent of you know reduction in shipping cost, right? these small margins on big problems have huge effects. so here's what's great netflix, which is kind of a funky organization, went into this thinking we want to see who the smartest data scientist is. first thing they found is it's not going to be a single person, it's going to be a team, right? because these were all teams, these were individual people. and then they found it was collaborations between teams. And so Neil's quote here is fantastic. He's like, look, this was all about collaboration between diverse ideas, not in some touchy, feely, unquantifiable, when people work together, good things happen sort of way. This was just measurable bonus after measurable bonus after measurable bonus, right? Which is really sort of a surprising thing. Okay, let me quickly talk about solving difficult problems, because this is sort of a, a different set of tasks. So in prediction, what happens is if there's some numerical thing like unemployment, inflation, you know, how many units of this copy are we going to sell? That's different than like trying to, you know, cure cancer or design a ship or something like that, right? So Lou Hong and I wrote a paper in 2001 where we said, suppose there's a difficult problem. And I create a bunch of problem solvers who are all capable and are different. I create moderately large teams. What we found is, is under some relatively mild assumptions. Um, a randomly selected team of competent people would beat a team of the best individuals, which was really surprising. We published this paper. Everything was fine. And there's this guy, Leandro Marcolini, who was just convinced this had to be wrong. So he went to grad school basically to sort of show we were wrong. And so what he did is he said, I'm going to have algorithms play the game of Go. So I'm going to construct a bunch of algorithms that are going to play the game of Go. And then what I'll do is I'll take teams of like seven really good algorithms, and I'll have them compete against teams of seven diverse algorithms. And the way it'll work is the algorithms will vote. So when it's time to move, the seven algorithms will say, I vote here, right? And whichever gets the majority vote, that'll be the move. And he fully expected the team of the best algorithms to win. But unfortunately for him, but unfortunately for us, it didn't happen here, right? The diverse algorithms won. But what's interesting about it, and this is the important takeaway, is that on the teams of the best algorithms, the votes were all 7-0 and 6-1. On the diverse algorithms, the votes were like 4-3-1-1 or 3-1-1-1-1-1, right? Because they were all had sort of different sets of ideas, right? So the best algorithms tended to be the same thing that Lou and I found. The best algorithms tended to be similar and therefore make the same mistakes. So jump ahead to 2015. Um, a friend of my wife had become president at Cornell, and she said, will you come and give a talk kind of like this to all of our deans and stuff? And there's this guy, John Kleinberg, who's a MacArthur Genius Award winner at Cornell. And he said, in honor of you coming in, I'll also prove you wrong. I'm like, you know, great. This seems to be a hobby for people in computer science. And so he worked up with uh, Maitha Raghu, who's one of his graduate students. And they said, we're going to think of this, even though we're computer scientists, like statisticians. And we're going to think of problem solving as people kind of dumping solutions on a table. Right? So somebody says, here's the problem. You just dump solutions on a table. And then I want to say, there's some function that maps all these solutions dumped onto the table into some final solution. And what they find, which is kind of amazing, is if it's like chopping down wood, right? so you just kind of add up everybody's best solutions, then the best team consists of the best people. As soon as it becomes nonlinear, that doesn't work. The best team no longer consists of the best people. As soon as there's any sort of interesting interaction thing going on, and not only that, they find for a whole bunch of nonlinear functions in this class of things, there's no test you can apply to individuals. So it's not, it's not even like, so there's no test you could come up with where the best team would consist of the best people according to that test. So the idea of having a test that you use to sort of admit people, hire people, doesn't make sense once the problem becomes hard for this space of problem. So then Lou and I said, that seems interesting. And so Lou and I, this is, 2018, or I should probably be sure 2000N, because since we'll be able to publish this. So we generalized what they do and say, suppose the problem solver just has some sort of type in some abstract mathematical space, and then there's an, some function that maps your type into some values that we're going to call the ability function. And then suppose there's some team function that takes a whole bunch of people that have some types and maps them into a value. When could there ever exist as a test? And this is going to sound like really ugly math, but it's not. So we find that a test, any test, exists only if and only if there exists what's called a monotone partial ordering based on types. What does that mean? That basically means that you're always better off bringing in someone of higher ability, which basically means there's only a test if it's like chopping down wood, which is kind of amazing. So this whole idea we have of like, what's your grade point average? What's your SAT score, right? How good do your letters like mapping people down to some one-dimensional score and hiring the best people? 
that only works if people are gonna kind of work in isolation. Once people are gonna work as part of a team, that's a fool's game, right? You really wanna unpack people and think in terms of vectors. So the executive summary here is on difficult problems, diversity matters, and often dominates ability. Okay, so this was kind of the land I was in prior to this most recent book, which is Scott stands around, writes things on a chalkboard, and says, my work here is done, okay? Um, now, there's data. And one of the interesting things about writing a theoretical book before there's data is you can't be wrong, which is good. <laughs> when there is data, I mean, I knew here I couldn't be wrong either, because the, these things are <coughs> mathematical identities. The question is like, how big was that delta gonna be? Right, was the diversity bonus gonna be like, oh, this big, or was it gonna be like really big? So here's the first thing, that you, first study that just kind of blew me away. And the only person I know in this is Jack Soule, is the second author. So Jack and his colleagues looked at 40 years of predictions by sort of top flight economists. So these are the, like there's 43 economists to predict the big six indicators, inflation, unemployment, that sort of stuff for the European Central Bank. There's also economists that predict the same things for the US government. 28,000 forecasts by professional economists. So these are all the big boys and girls. The crowd, so in any one of these things, there might be 43 or 14 or 19 people picked. The crowd is 21% better than the average person. That's crazy. I wouldn't, have, I wouldn't have dared make that up. I would have said 4%, right? Here's what's even crazier. This is a great chart, by the way. If you're a Tufty fan, this is like, doesn't get much better than this. Here's one random economist. We'll baseline them at one. Here's two random economists. They're 8% better. Here's three random economists, 12% better, right? Now, let's take the best economist. The best economist to date. So let's, let's, let's look, like, we've ranked everyone at the current moment. David is like the Alabama and Clemson of economists or something, right? So he's ranked number one in both polls. He's done the best to date. He's gonna be 10% better than average economist. That makes sense, that's about what you'd think. Now let's average him with Marvin, who's the second best economist. Now, Marvin's worse than David. We've got five years of data saying he's worse, which means he's not 10%. When I average him with David, I get another 8% better. You think that, I mean, like, if I have one stock that's performing at 8%, another one's performing at 6%, and you think invest in both, you'll get 7%. You'll do worse. You'll get the average. When you have people constructing high dimensional models of something like the economy, and you average two people with very different models, you get this big bonus, right? Here's the crowd, 21% better, right? And here's if you take the best five or six, you actually get like 24% better, right? So the point is, is what you really want is you wanna have seven or eight different economists, right? And you're fortunate here because no two economists agree, and that actually ends up being a good thing, right? But again, this is data you wouldn't dare make up. But you could say these are just economists. What about people who like really invest money? So this is all 10,000 mutual funds over a 35 year period. Um, this is an unpublished paper, but I think this data's gotta be right. Um, if you look at mutual funds that have three people on them, run by three people, they do 60 basis points. So that's 0.6% better than funds run by one person. That's a huge difference. That's a massive difference if you hang out in the space. And if you're a political scientist, Alan will love this, funds run by two and four people do better, but not quite as well. And that's because with two and four, you can get a tie. <laughs> right? These are binary decisions. So odd numbers, political scientists like the fact that odd numbers tend to work better than even numbers. Here's some pretty compelling evidence that that's true, okay? If you look at identity, men only funds do 3% better than individual people do, mostly men. Men and women run funds do 6% better. Women only funds, there's only 17 of them. You need 20 of the statistics, so we don't know. Right? But maybe in some future, there'll be some more, at least 20 women only funds. But again, expense ratios and 10-year um, mean they're much better. So that's prediction. Let's look at problem. So for problem solving, I'm gonna look at academic research and patents. So this is 1960. This is the number of authors. So the modal paper had one, had two authors, just barely more than one. There's like 20,000 papers. Here's 2016. The modal paper has six to 11 authors, okay? And there's very few with one. And you could say, you know, why is this? Here's why. If you get 100 citations, like so if you look at Google Scholar and look at how many times something's cited, something gets 100 citations, that counts as a fairly important paper. The odds of getting a paper with 100 citations is four and a half times as large if it's team author as opposed to individual author. Now you could say, how big's the data set? And I could say 28 million. This is every paper ever published. 
And these data sets, it's ridiculous, right? Like, used to be people do studies like this, like we randomly sampled 500 papers. No, this is everyone. 20 minutes. This is Brian Uzi, Daniel Romero, who's here in our information school. Download every single paper, okay? Gets even better than that. You could say, what's causing these teams to be better? This only uses 21 million papers, so maybe we won't believe it, okay? <laughs> Here's your baseline paper. Here's the bonus you get from having people who have a lot of citations in the past. So this is like an ability bonus, which makes sense. This is a diversity bonus, the red box. What do I mean by diversity bonus? Here's what they did, which is really creative. They look at, they randomly choose pairs of papers that you cited and ask, are you citing papers that haven't been cited in the past together? So what's the frequently they, frequency they've been cited in the past? So if you're combining unique ideas, this is the bonus that comes from sort of cognitive diversity. This is the bonus that comes on top of this bonus and this bonus if you have both ability and diversity, right? So this is just like, you know, the cross through Scalia's heart here at this point, right? Because what it's basically saying is it's not excellence or diversity. Excellence, good. Diversity, good. Excellence plus diversity, even better than excellence and diversity. There's an excellence and diversity bonus, right? And again, this is on every academic paper ever published. What about patents? Here the data set's smaller, it's only five million. 19th century, there's 161,000 categories for the patents, which is a lot. Um, in the 19th century, over half of patents came from a single category. Now only 12% do. In the last 50 years, and last year it was under 10%. So most innovations are coming actually from combining ideas. Lada Adama, who used to be in my research group er, in complex systems here and now is at Facebook, looked at this and found a similar result to what um, Uzi found. She uses this thing called proximity, which is how similar are the ideas the authors have worked on in the past. And proximity negatively correlates with high impact citations. So basically, if you're working on similar stuff within the same categories, you don't have a big impact. Again, this is on every patent ever issued. OK, so let's, that's the cognitive side. So now let's talk about identity really quickly. When you think about identity diversity, it turns out it gets really complicated really fast, right? So what I'm gonna sort of, and in the book, one of the real challenges was, how do you present this in a way that people, this is a space also, when you go talk to people in policy, you talk to people in business, people are kind of afraid to talk about this, right? People become very uncomfortable. So how do you present things in a way that are sort of useful? So one thing people used to think about identity in terms of like, let's take a particular thing like gender, race, age, religion, and, let's, and we can think about maybe how that maps to Right? Differences in information, differences in knowledge. You might say, what is their gender-based knowledge here? Is there a gender-based representation? That's been sort of, I think, pushed aside in favor of sort of uh, uh, several different ways to look at it. So one is what I'm gonna call the bundle of sticks idea, which is due to Wasau and Sen. And the idea that they have is you can think of a person as Person's identity is having all these things in it. So this is an idea that sometimes you know referred to as intersectionality, right? So there's all these different parts for identity, and they're interwoven. You can't just pull out one part. So you can't pull out the identity part. You can't pull out the gender part, just the race part. So Catherine will joke, we've seen our presenting something, and someone said, Scott and I can talk all day, and you're not gonna know what a black man thinks. Right? So you can't take the African part, African American part out of her, the male part out of me, and then say, now we know an African American male thing. Right? You just can't pull those things out, right? So all these things are interconnected. The second framework that gets invoked is the iceberg framework. Right? So it used to be that when we think about this sort of water, above the waterline and below the waterline, right? In the sense that we can, we'd look at someone, we could sort of figure out things like their skin color, their age, their gender, their physical quality. But there's other stuff that's below the iceberg. And the stuff below the iceberg may actually matter more than the stuff above the iceberg. Where things have gotten really sort of confusing and interesting of late is now that we live sort of in Google land, right? The virtual waterline is very different than the physical waterline. So a lot of the data we see, a lot of the studies we see are actually based on this sort of virtual waterline that we can scrub off the web, right? As opposed to what we see in the real world, right? Not the other isn't real, but like things like physical, ironically, physical features, the stuff that's sort of the basis of the old iceberg model is the one thing that's kind of below the waterline oftentimes in the new iceberg model. The third framework that comes into play is what biologists call the there is no cardinal or there is no great blue heron model. I prefer the there is no great blue heron model version because we have the Audubon collection here. So if you go and look at the Audubon collection at the University of Michigan with the drawings, 
he's got this picture of a great blue heron, right? But some biologist will begin their intro ecology class by saying there's no such, there is no great blue heron. What do they mean? They mean when you think about a species, you want to think about there being a population of great blue herons. So great blue heron is an individual thing, but it's a full pop, it's a population of things, and that population has variation within it. So every time a great blue heron dies, and every time a great blue heron is born, what it means to be a great blue heron changes. Right? But this diversity, this variation within phenotypically and genotypically within the population of great blue herons is what allows them to change and grow and evolve, right? So, you know, variation, speciation, right? This is the essence of Darwinian right evolution. The point is, is that like this diversity is actually a good thing. Right? So you can't really say there is a great blue heron, just like you can't say there's a Caucasian male, or here's a you know a, someone who's you know a middle-aged transgender person or something like that. You're drawing from a whole population, so you got to be careful to avoid this sort of stereotyping. Now, this is some work by Ron Engelhart from the World Values Survey. I thought since we're talking to ISR, I'll put this up. But these are the people from Sweden, right? Projected on Ron's two dimensions, and these are the people from Zimbabwe. So there is no Swedish person, right? There is no Zimbabwe. In fact, like. Some of these Zimbabweans right here might be happier in Sweden. And some of these Swedes might be more Zimbabwean in terms of like what their political attitudes and stuff are. So the thing is, you want to think of any group that you create as there being no great blue heron, right? That there's tremendous heterogeneity within the group. There also, there's some sort of iceberg where you're only seeing part of it, right? And also, people are sort of these bundles of sticks, right? So within any group that you create, like if you say, how do women differ from men in this particular case, you've got to think all three frameworks in mind. Right? is you can't just pull out the gender component. You're only seeing part of this. And there's tremendous heterogeneity within the group, which gets to this sort of like idea of intersectionality in the sense that right, we've got to really have a very problematized notion of identity group. And so when I try and when I want to make the argument that this sort of diversity, which are all sort of bundled together, and there's tremendous heterogeneity within here, maps to this, it's got to kind of be many to many as opposed to one to one or one to many, right? It's going to be complicated. So how does it work? Well, there's three levels at which it works, right? And again, this, I want to be really clear, this is not um, my work so much as it is the work of a lot of people thinking about this in very deep ways. So one is just the straight up syllogism, okay? I've shown logic and data showing that cognitive diversity leads to better outcomes. Identity diversity clearly influences cognitive diversity. So therefore, identity diversity increases cognitive diversity, which leads to better outcomes. Right? Not on all problems, but on some problems. Okay? So it's just going to work like that. Two, there's strong group effects. And this is one that people, that the data is just continuing to be amassed. If you're in a room with people who look differently than you do, you think harder and you make better arguments. Okay, so this is Catherine's work in Scientific American. She says, you know, decades of research by organizational scientists, psychologists, sociologists, economists, and microbiologists show that diverse groups um, are more innovative than homogeneous groups, right? And she says, look, it seems obvious, so here she's trashing my work, right? It seems obvious that um, if you had diverse expertise, you would do better. But it's less obvious that social diversity would matter, right? But what she shows in her work and other people show in their work is that the types of argumentation people give and the awareness people have changes. So if you, um, I was talking to an architect about this, if you're designing a building and you put a blind person in the room, when people are talking about design, or you put a disabled person in the room, right, people think very differently about the problem. So that we get. But it's also true if you put a woman in a room of all men, Right, a person of color in a room of all white people, people think very differently, they argue very differently, and they make different cases. Here's, though, where I think it gets tricky. And this is Catherine's work. So Catherine does this experiment where she has people read a whodunit. Right? So it's just a simple set of logic problem. And then she puts together groups of people, some of whom are homogeneous in terms of what they think and which, in this case, what fraternity they were in. And some of them are the reverse in terms of they think of different things and they're also belong to different fraternities. So what you know is the diverse groups should, this is a prediction contest, have to do better than the homogeneous groups, right? So you've got the theorem, right? So the theorem would have to not hold for this to not be true. So when I was reading this paper, I was like, well, she's just proving that like hypotenuse equals squared equals leg squared plus leg squared. Why is she doing this, right? But what she did, which is always interesting, is she asked people, how good is your group? 
She even let them bet money on how accurate their group is. And here's what happens. People in homogeneous groups think their groups are better. They even bet more money that their groups are better. And here's sort of the, like, so I sit on the LSNA um, executive committee, so we make tenure decisions. And like, sometimes I get outvoted, right? And when I come home from the meetings and I'm outvoted, typically not happy, right? Because somebody's staying on the island who I thought should have been voted off, or someone's getting kicked off the island that I thought was brilliant and should stay on the island, right? And my wife will like, show me this paper. Mm -hmm. like, look, the only way the group is smarter than me is if they outvote me sometimes, right? Otherwise, the group can't be smarter than me. And so the fact is, if you're in a diverse group, this is like, let's go back to Leandro's Go algorithms voting. If you've got a whole bunch of really similar Go algorithms, everybody's using the exact same rubric, the votes are going to be 7 0, 7 0, 7 0, 6 1, 6 1. And we're going to walk out of there saying, we are awesome. We have a strong culture. We all agree. Everything's great. Just made another good decision, right? If you've got a whole bunch of diverse models looking at these hard problems, you're going to get four, three votes. And when you're on the three, you're going to be, right? We just screwed this thing up. Well, maybe you didn't screw it up. If it's complex and if there's diversity, it's going to be 4-3. And you got to walk out of there and you got to say, that's awesome. I just lost a vote. No, because if you hadn't lost a vote, you would be supreme dictator. And in my case, that would be bad. Right? I've got enough history to know. Like, you know, there's a long list of bad decisions on my part. OK. Third one, and this is maybe the most important. Identity diversity influences what we study and how we study what we study in a very deep way. So people will say things like nothing about us without us, right? And if you look at sort of, let's just look at people with disabilities, people without disabilities in terms of, you know, their employment rates, their obesity rates, whether they smoke, um, all sorts of things. But you see huge differences. If you look at infant mortality rates across um, racial and ethnic groups, you see huge differences. If you look at sort of life expectancy based on incomes groups, you see huge differences. So any way you want to slice American society, the lives we live and the things that interest us are going to change, right? Um, let's go back to this obesity, things by race and origin. You see big differences. So if you take any subject, and I'm just going to take altruism here because uh, I think with Jim was a student of yours as well, I hope, or not? Yep. Okay, good. I nailed that one. All right, so Bob Axel is one of our college. He studies altruism. Jim Andriotti got his PhD here. He studies algorithm. Jackie Matisse is on the executive committee with me. He studies altruism. But Bob, you know, sort of has a scientist bent, and he studied altruism both in terms of, like, sort of biological systems. He's done work on sort of cooperation within cancer cells. And he looks at this sort of in a very sort of algorithmic sort of way, right? Jim Andrioni, who comes at this like an economist, looks at things like wealth effects, does lots of experience and thinks about how much people have other regarding preferences, stuff like that. And what Jim's work shows, and what Bob's work shows, is if you put systems under stress, there tends to be less cooperation. And that's what people tend to believe, right? But then Jackie, who studies, um, you know, sort of lower income African American communities and looks at um, altruism within those, finds the opposite is true. When you put the community under stress, people actually cooperate more, right? Because there's sort of cultural differences between the people, the, un the sort of rich white undergrads that Jim is studying in his laboratory, right, and the people that she's studying out there in the real world. So it's not that she's right and he's wrong, it's that they're studying the same question in different ways and coming to different conclusions and collectively leading us to a richer understanding. But the question she's studying, they wouldn't have thought of studying. Right? So these three effects are, right? one is just who we are affects how we think in certain ways. Being in a room with people differently makes us think differently. And then what we decide to study is a function of who we are. All of those make diverse groups sort of better. So when you think about how you select people, one of the real challenges here, like so you said there's no test. right? You can't give a test and say, here's the people we should hire. The challenge is of avoiding what my friend Sheen Levine calls the siren call of sameness, right? You see someone who went to the same grad school you went with, publishes in the same journals you publish in, knows the same techniques that you know, and so you tend to think, she's really smart, he's really smart. When in fact, all the data says, that's the last person you should hire, right? You should be hiring someone who went to a different school and knows different stuff. If you look at NASA, right, which is a very sort of um, meritocratic place in some place, some ways. In 2015, they listed the five new people who will sit in sort of the mission control seat. So these will probably be the five people who would like take someone to Mars. And you might think, wow, these people probably went to fabulous schools. And you know, these are all fine schools, but there's no Caltech up here. There's no MIT up here. And I was asking them, I said, where's the Caltech people? And they said, the intersection of Caltech and listening 
<laughs> empty shell. No, and the point was is that the Celtic people play a different role, right? The people at Celtic are the people who are like churning through things, have tons and tons of ideas, but like it's not necessarily, these are the judgment people. These are the people with humility, right? So you think of the vector of, so think of each person as sort of like a toolbox, a vector of sort of skills and abilities. You're more likely to get someone who's sort of got the humility and the judgment and the inclusiveness if they came from a less prestigious school, right? Um, if you look at Google, and one of the things that's interesting about going on in this space is that we have large N, but some of these other places, their N is just enormous. They get three and a half million applicants a year, right? So they can run a lot of numbers on who's successful, who's not successful, that sort of stuff. Most like large consulting companies, banks, they get a couple hundred thousand applicants a year. And they're just reading in those resumes and transcripts and applying machine learning algorithms to them like crazy, right? Looking for patterns. One of the things that Google finds is problem solving ability is the main criteria for hiring, which is not a one dimensional thing. Right? So they're looking for different ways in which people solve things. And if you look at where they hire from, people tend to say, oh, they hire from the Ivy League. Cornell is the highest ranked Ivy school at seven. Harvard's at 10, Pennsylvania's at nine. They hire much more from um, public school. I mean, Stanford's a private school at the top. But a lot of public schools. And they found that like, this diversity of schools matters a lot because people just learn different tricks. Right? You learn different ways of doing things. So one of the things I did at NASA, which was sort of fun, is we looked at um, the syllabi from fluid dynamics courses at different universities, and you think it's the same everywhere. It's not. You actually learn different stuff. So at MIT, if you take fluid dynamics, you, learned, you learn windmills. And you might think somebody should call them up and say, windmills are not in the water, right? But they know that, obviously, I hope. But the thing is, but what they realize at MIT is if you learn windmills, it helps you understand propellers. Whereas at Illinois, they're like, doesn't matter. We're going to study water flowing over rocks. Why? Because there's a lot of glacial land and they study that way. So if you take, even of course like fluid dynamics is going to differ. If you take electrical engineering at Illinois, you're going to study a lot on semiconductors, which you're not going to study at Cornell. So the last thing I want to end with this on inclusiveness. So when we talk about diversity, equity, inclusion, right? It's not just about having the people in the room, but it's also about having sort of meaningful interactions among them. And so one of my favorite quotes in this space is the David Foster Wallace quote, where he talks about two little fish swimming in a pond, and this other older fish comes up and says, morning boys, how's the water, right? And then the one fish, he swims away, and the one fish says the other, what the hell is water, right? One of the most surprising things to me about going out and visiting you know, lots of government agencies, nonprofits, corporations, talking through this work is how different the water is in every single place. It's amazing how different the water is. And one of the things I want to push on here, and I'll end with this, is this is a wonderful uh, book by Kim Scott has this book. I think it's called like How to Be a Kick-Ass Boss or something like that. She has this idea called radical candor. And one of the things I truly do to appreciate in sort of writing this book is the power of sort of two by two categorizations and having a diversity of them and looking at the world, right? Somebody has these books with sort of great little box models. And I used to think, oh my God, another stupid box model. But now I realize, well, if you have a whole bunch of those, it allows you to really sort of be a diverse thinker on your own. And here's hers, and I'll end with this, which is kind of fun. She says, when you think about managing in a diverse workspace, there's two dimensions that really matter. One is you have to care personally about people. People have to be, and there's strong work by Robin Ely, David Thomas, Jeff Polzer, Beta Mannix, Maggie Neal, looking at sort of what allows diverse groups to do well. And it boils down to people have to feel validated. They've got to feel included. They've got to feel like people want them there, right? Everybody does. So people have to care personally. But also, the ideas have to be challenged, right? You've got to deeply engage the ideas. It can't just be, Oh, thank you for sharing that, right? It's, the whole point is sort of working through ideas in some sort of deep way. So what I love about this box is, and here's where I think Michigan sometimes fails, is that if you care personally but you're not challenging directly, you end up in this ruinous empathy box, right? Like we're so happy to have our diverse team, right? But you're not actually challenging the ideas. There's some corporations you go to and they're, they're clearly in this obnoxious aggression box. Right, where, where we're challenging, like Ray Dalio has this new book out called The Principles, which talks about Bridgewater. And uh, Ray and I would have been recently, and he's clearly in the obnoxious aggression box, but he's like, look, I pay people enough money that they should be able to handle being in the obnoxious aggression box. So he's sort of just accepting people who are willing to be down here. But the place where we want to all be, if we want to think about diversity, actually sort of allowing us to find better solutions, right, to make better predictions, to do what a place like ISR does better, is in this radical candor box. Right? So people have to feel as though we're all part of the same community, but it's also got to be the case 
that, I mean, again, the job of the university is to generate, one of the jobs of the university is to generate and refine ideas. We've also got to be in this challenge directly space. All right. Thank you very, very much. We have time now for questions, right? I hope. Yes. Questions, comments, critiques. It's all good now. Everybody's perfectly fine. <laughs> so I have a question. Okay. Are we using the mic for questions or? She's got the mic. So if you were, uh, I want to be. Um, uh, kind of devil's advocate yeah. uh, uh, from the Scalia perspective, say, and what what, what he might uh, say if he were still with us. May he rest in peace. But um, uh, he is with a different form. What he is with us in different form. Yes, um, that if you think about, uh, I mean, a lot of the things you said relate to kind of hiring, uh, and you know, right. should you be looking for the best person and have these indicators, or should you be? Right. Uh, trying to trying to have a diverse uh, pool, and you might say, well, you, you know, it, if you just took what you said to the extremes, it's like we should just take the 150 applicants we get for our next job and just, you know, pull the name right. out of a hat, um, and you just do the same thing on the right. next uh, position, and we'd get, you know, we'd get this benefit of diversity, but, right. you know, are you really saying that we wouldn't lose anything by not looking at those credentials so, and tr and trying to trying to have uh, quality workers? Yeah, so one of the things that's really, I think, intriguing about this is like when you write, let us let me first tell you what you can sort of, what you sort of find mathematically when you play in this spaces and see what that would suggest sort of empirically, is imagine I've got some sort of like competence threshold that I can test for, like are you able to, you know, sort of perform the basic task? Then the question is like where do you put that threshold? So, I mean, so there's a sense in which if I said, if you let me set the threshold, should I randomly draw from above that threshold? Or will you let me set sort of, I think even a better way is to set sort of like multiple thresholds, right? And then let me randomly draw sort of above that threshold. You'll do better. But you do even, but you do much better if you sort of like think of there being some sort of, having some understanding of what a competency threshold is, and then look for people who've had different sets of experiences, right? So if you look at a place like, I mean, Northrop Grumman's a really interesting case. They found that like, if they'd have a bunch of engineers who all worked on the same project and put them on another project, it doesn't work as well as if you have people who've worked on different projects. Because you just learn a completely different set of lessons from building this plane, from building this submarine. But there's all sorts of engineering challenges that get in the way. And so one of the sort of relevant measures of diversity there is sort of like, have you worked on different stuff? Right? Brian Uzi, who's one of the people who did the, um, the work on the academic papers, you look at Broadway shows. If you take a group of people who did one Broadway show and it's super successful, have them do another one, you get a B plus. You need to mix in, you know, other new people. You need, you know, you need new ideas added into the mix. So I think the challenge, I think this is one of the things where there's you need judgment. And I think that a lot of cases you end up with this sort of feeling of um, we figured out usually just sort of in an ad hoc way, some measure of who's good. Like, Grade point average for this. Now let's pick the highest people. Now we pick these highest people. Let's see if we meet some diversity criteria. That ends up, I think, getting you in a lot of trouble and isn't the right way to do it because what you might do instead is say, okay, what, what skills or understanding and experiences does someone need to actually be useful in this setting, right? Or to make us sort of more productive. And then let's make sure that we've picked a collection of people that are going to sort of, you know, be interesting and make this a worthwhile. Mm -hmm. Endeavor. So there's a recent um, hullabaloo at the University of Maryland where they're picking people for a moot court and they had some criteria they used and then it was like all rich white suburban kids and then so they reached out to let's take these two Latinos because so we have some diversity and then someone said well I don't think this one's very good and this was about like how can you talk about like racial justice in the United States with a whole group of just rich white I mean it doesn't even pass any sort of sniff test and the idea that like your grade point average or your SAT score at age 17 is the relevant characteristic for participating in moot court. Just, you know, it boggles the mind, right? So I think what you want to think about is, um, like if, when you do graduate admissions, you want to think about like, you know, what set of experiences, you know, what set of backgrounds, what sort of training might be relevant for this field of study? And then is there evidence? Because we do have evidence, like if you don't score above a certain level on the GMAT quant thing or something like that, that maybe you can't handle the, 
material. But you know, given those sort of thresholds, I think you don't want to choose randomly, but you want to choose diversely. Right. Question. Just ripping on that, Scott. Um, if that if you're choosing diversity, do you have to have a diverse group to actually choose diversity? Right. That's right. No, and that's that becomes. Um, I think that's a real problem for a lot of places, right? And this is where the water thing comes in, right? I think that you end up, when you look at sort of why you lose, um, like why is organizations sort of move higher up, they have less diverse candidate pools to choose from is because the water is filtering people out because they just don't want to be there, right? Like I know some Wall Street firms have, you know, identified people that they see as moving into leadership and the people have been exited as a result of that because they just don't want to, you know, because they don't want they don't want that lifestyle. Or they don't want to be in that place. Yeah, Patrick. The next step in the process is how do you manage a group like that? Right. And that's got to require a different set of skills and sensitivities, I would think. Have you done any research on that? Yeah, so again, this is, I mean, this is one reason why we had Catherine write the, um, <coughs> Write the following. One of the, the sort of the ending of the the last chapter I write in the book talks about the sort of necessity of practice. Like it's it's much much harder to manage a diverse team than it is to manage a homogeneous team, partly because of the fact that there's so much more potential and there's more ideas, right? So when you think about like in this space of like you know people generating more ideas, you're going to get possibly more good ideas, but you're almost certainly going to get more bad ideas, and that means then that one of the things that's you know, very difficult to do is sort of appreciate people for coming up, right, with bad ideas. Um, and also, if somebody's on the losing side in a homogeneous group, that's usually sort of easier to massage than if someone's, you know, a, you know, sort of an identity minority person in a group and is on the losing side, right? And so there's just I mean, there's no end of sort of different of difficulties that involve this. One of the things that, like, I, I brought up the other day in a a talk is, if you look at sort of all the big advances in artificial intelligence, right, it's all, it's most of it, like in this Netflix prize example, it's using ensembles of learners. You know, so it's, it's not that like, so all this sort of, all the facial recognition stuff, all the amazing sort of things that are pushing those ads at you, isn't one big algorithm. What is one big algorithm? That one big algorithm consists of a whole bunch of diverse algorithms that are looking at different features. And the reason why is an ensemble of diverse algorithms basically doesn't overfit, right? And ends up being much more robust and can sort of, you know, cast a much, much wider net. So what's interesting is the way we create the smartest possible artificial intelligence things is by giving them different data and having them learn different models, right? But the thing is, they don't have any issues. <laughs> you know, there's no baggage with those algorithms, right? And so I view that, so someone says, what's the most compelling evidence for this line of thinking? I actually think it's in AI. But you've got to get to that place of practice. And the practice thing, I mean, the I think where we have to come at this with tremendous humility is um, when I was in LA for, I, I, this is in the book, I think. So the 1980 Lakers, I'm a big basketball guy, that in the was two years after the three-point shot was introduced. This is one of the greatest teams ever. Kareem, Magic, Worthy, Byron Scott. They made 13 three-pointers for the year, right? Why? Because they couldn't make them, right? So one of the things that, like, when when Earl Lewis talks about this book, he says that, you know, he's like, look, Scott is just a flat-out pragmatist. There is no magic here. There's no magic bonus. So the reason I use that example in the book is because, like, what's going on is there was magic practice. Look to 1988. Magic makes 106 three-pointers. He goes from making 15% to making, like, almost 40%. Why? Because he stood out there and took a hundreds of shots every day. Meanwhile, little Stefan Curry was sitting in his dirt driveway taking thousands of shots, right? But the point is, you can do that on your own, right? I think the challenge here, and this is why I think the university setting is so important. I'm just going to channel Pat Gurren, who the book is dedicated to, right? Pat's main point was that universities are this special place where we can bring people together in safe environments and they can learn to be in this group. It's like four years of practice from the three-point line, and then we're going to send you out, right? And that's why I think you know it's the the university setting is so important. Like if you go to BlackRock, if you go to Google, if you go to the Fed, they're going to be like, look, I want to do this, but it's costly, and I can't get you know people don't know how to do it. So it's on us, right? I think it's it's our charge, in some sense, to create to help people develop 
the human capital, where they're good in these diverse groups and they learn to manage these diverse groups. Because what, what the data shows like, and what the logic shows is the bonuses are there. And on some problems, the bonuses are going to be huge. And on social problems, like the kind of stuff we do in ISR, I think the bonuses are going to be enormous. Like, is it surprising that a lot of our social problems relate to diversity and that we don't have diverse people <laughs> working on those social problems? You know, it'd be like, if you didn't have an engineer, you'd have engineering problems, right? So I think that like this is a, the work suggests, and that's why I dedicated the book to Pat, that after you work all the way through it, you say basically Pat's right, right? So frequently I ask a lot of questions about groups and the level of diversity. Mm -hmm. How diverse does a group have to be to be successful? Is by adding one person? Is it by adding two people? At what point do you see a difference in the in the innovation or the productivity of a team? So this is what you know, let's go back to the sort of intersectionality idea that like we're all sorts of you know we're big bundles of things. One of the things that if I'm the, if you're the only person from a particular identity dimension in a group, like the only woman, the only person of color, the only physically disabled person, sometimes you can end up playing the role of that person. And if you do that, if you play the role of that identity group as opposed to playing yourself, oftentimes you don't get the full benefit, right? Because what you really want, with the, again, this is not my work at all, but the work of people in organizational theory, what you really want is people kind of bring in their whole selves and feeling really self, really safe sharing everything they know. And so my sense is that the answer is, it depends on the person and the place and almost on the water. I think you'd like the University of Michigan to be a place where if you're the only person that looked like you in a room, you knew that it was a safe enough space, everybody was validated, people really care about their home, that you could share anything, right? We're probably not there yet. Not everyone's there yet. Some people are there, right? Um, but I think that, in that how much of a burden that is, I think depends on the person. Right. I mean, Earl's talks a lot about Earl Lewis talks a lot about the the safe space notion here. That the better the safe spaces are, right, the lower that number can be, right, because you're kind of coming in with a lot of momentum, right. But if you're not coming in with a lot of, you know, look, I mean, as a as a white guy, I'm skateboarding downhill all the time, right. I mean, so I can, you know, you put me in any sort of space, I know I can walk out. It's safe, and that allows me probably to share more fully than people would want me to. Some respects, right? But I think for other people, it's a lot harder because when they even when they walk out of the room, right, they're not going to have the same feeling of safety. You, so I think that the answer is it depends on creating the right culture. There are some people like Dinah Boyd that would argue that, you know, two is a lot different than one. And my personal experience would suggest that that's probably true. That two is a lot different than one because of that. You know, you're performing the role of the person in that identity group. Maybe one more in the back, and then we'll, yeah. Yeah, so it took me a while to figure this out. But like, where do you see the role of like kind of the fear of failure coming into play? Because I mean, like, even in some of the questions, to yeah. me, there was like a inherent fear of failure yeah. right. in it not working. And that yeah. would be the resistance to doing it. And that even could affect how people lead. And if someone says, I never fail, is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing? So kind of. Have you seen this is, no, so you know it's funny because the so Astro um, Astro Teller, the Google guy, he gives a big prize and a, and a, a huge trophy and I think cash money to the people who kill the best project. So they look at all the projects that were killed and the very best project that was killed gets a big bonus because at Google they want to get rid of the mediocre even right and so at Google there's even a fear of the mediocre right because you just want because you want everything to be like 10x a thousand x. One of the, and so one of the things I think that and this is why I push hard against the portfolio analogy, right? It's easy to think of diversity as risk. Like when you see this sort of like in my in the difference, I ended the difference with this thing I called the the parable of the bikes, which is that if I take a bunch of six-year-olds, line them up in a parking lot, and have them run as far as they can in 10 seconds, I'm going to get a mean of about 50 meters, but it's going to be a pretty tight distribution. Some will go 40, some will go 60. Take those same kids and have them ride bikes. The mean's still going to be about 50. Some kids are going to go a long way, and then there's going to be carnage over here, <laughs> right? And if you look at the literature on diverse groups, it kind of looks that way. Homogeneous groups, except for the mean is lower in homogeneous groups, right? But it's a tighter distribution. The diverse groups, that's why like with the academic research and with the patents, the diverse groups do worse, and they do 
best, right? So you could look at that and you could say, that's risk, right? If we were in a chopping down trees kind of economy and you were worried about average performance all the time, that would be true. But we're in an economy where once something, you know, in the weightless economy, it's the best things that get replicated many, many, many times. So variance actually in many of these cases is a really good thing. You're looking for the great idea. You're looking for the really amazing thing. And you just, and so where this, I think, where the fear thing comes in from management is you've just got to say, we need some ability to recognize failure quickly, accept it, say that happens, and move on. But also recognize that all the evidence, and this is um, less, uh, this is Watson and uh, Kumakar, that diverse groups get better over time. This is like three point tuning. I mean, the more you do it, the better you get. And so that's, and so the reason why I think um, this argument is important, the reason why I spend time going into these talks is that the bonus is there. If the bonus weren't there, and this were entirely resting on a social justice narrative, then this loss thing becomes harder, right? Because it's kind of like, man, this is going to be a huge cost and things can go bad. I don't get anything out of it. But I think in the modern society, a lot of people, and this is, a, I think, a, a sense of great joy, are spending their lives doing things that really matter to them, right? That they deeply care about. And if you deeply care about the thing you're doing, you should want to do that really, really well, right? And you should want your teams to do that really well, you want your organizations to do that really well. And what the evidence shows is people who think differently than you are going to make you better at that, right? And so if you come at it that way, then you recognize, yeah, okay, there's going to be a learning curve here, but you know, let's learn to ride the bike. And I think if we can learn to ride the bike, right, good stuff will happen. That's the hope. Right. Thank you very, very much. Great. Thanks a lot. Fabulous talk. Coming.